Hello, I'm Tara Brabazon. I'm the Dean of Graduate Research at Flinders University and welcome to Vlog 207. How to set up your life to write. This vlog has aligned, amalgamated a series of requests from you. You know, really interesting requests like how to set up your desk to write pre-writing rituals, pre-writing routines, writing behaviours and all of those great requests come together really to think about how we organise your entire life to write. So what I'm going to do today is offer some very very quick, some jabbing interventions in your life. And the literature on writing and productivity is quite good. So what I'm doing is I'm taking the best of that literature and shaping it and organising it, particularly for PhD students and indeed researchers more generally. And all of it is based really on an assumption or a premise that I agree with. But you might not, but everything we're doing today comes from this premise. That writing emerges from a context. It emerges from an environment. And that environment is not a posh lab or a million dollar mansion or even a really attractive posh carved desk. No. But writing does emerge from a place, a space and a time. So let's try and create some incisive moments of decision and discussion for you. How we organise your life to write. Now you'll notice the phrasing of this vlog and I've used that phrasing intentionally because if your life, and a lot of your lives are this, an already overflowing bucket, so if your life is just filled with everything, I see you, <laughs> then you can't magically add writing to that and think there's going to be space. If you want to do a PhD, if you want to write, if you want to research, you have to reorganise your entire life to do that. We have to create some space for writing. So there's going to have to be changes from you. So I'm going to offer a series of somethings for you to think about to perhaps change. Now, 99% of these somethings, you might go, oh, look, no, that's just bonkers. Cool. But there might be just one suggestion I offer to you that hits you and it might just transform a bit of your day to organise your life for writing. So let's clean up your life or let's at least clean up your desk for writing. And of course I am recording this vlog and I'm doing it intentionally. I've recorded this vlog at home. This is my home office. This is the only place that I write. I don't write at all. I don't do any research at all in my work office. My work office is for you. It's a consultancy office. I see people. I do the Dean work there. I only write these days here very early in the morning. And what's weird is almost all of my offices around the world have looked pretty well identical. So there's a chair, a desk, some books, and that's about it. And I suddenly realized as I was preparing for this vlog this week, that this old desk, which is a bit wonky, I suddenly realized when I was preparing the equipment around it, this old desk that is a bit wonky is a very, very special, magical object in my life. I've written 10 books and 88 refereed articles and book chapters on this desk. The desk itself is 10 years old. I've written hundreds of lectures and seminars, probably not even able to count the number of sessions and seminars I've written on this desk. And look, it's moved with me around the world through three countries, however many jobs, it's remarkable. And can I just say, it's really, really cheap. This desk came as a flat pack <laughs> from Ikea. It cost 20 quid. And look, it is a bit wonky. It is a bit tired. It is a bit emotional, but it does the job. The seat that I'm sitting on, a bit of an odd one, as you can see, I'm quite high. I do like being quite high at a desk and I have a, a writing thing, an object that I put my computer on. So I am quite high. But this chair, as you can see, no, no arms or anything, cost 40 quid. So it's not about the poshness, it's about what suits you, what creates that space for you to do what you'd like to do. So preparation is everything 
for writing. Preparation is indeed everything for success. So here are some very, very small slices in your life that might create efficiency or productivity or at least a reflection on your life and the place of writing and research within it. Okay, first one. Leaning to one side. Have a plan. Have a whiteboard. One of the reasons that procrastination exists, I think, is because you haven't planned what your next task is. So, as you know, at the start of each year on New Year's Day for me, I sit with my whiteboard and I plan out the research for my year. We, in fact, did a whole vlog on this. I think it was like how to do a research plan. And you can see the whiteboard and me doing it in real time. And I do plan my publications for the entire year. So as you can see, it sits, this whiteboard, in my office and I have three headings on it. What I'm planning to write, so what is being written, to be written, what is under refereeing, and the third one is published, right? So what is to be written, under refereeing, and published. And the goal is to move stuff from the top of the table to the bottom of the table. Now, I'm recording this vlog in March, right? So the third month of the year. I had a very unusual, quite wonderful start to the year. Because as you can see, unusually for me, I've only got one article under review, under refereeing, because I had three articles accepted for publication in the last 10 days. Who knew that's never happened to me before? So that means the piece I'm working on at the moment is the PhD media piece. I'll have that finished by Sunday. That'll move into the next category. And my next article on panic fitness, I go straight to. So you see, there's no procrastination, nothing going on. I know exactly and order my research in terms of what am I doing today, Sunday, I finish that. Monday morning, I know what's happening. So the gift of this system is if you're really, really busy, which we all are, you don't have to spend spend one moment thinking, oh, look, what will I do next? So I've given myself the task, as you can see by that whiteboard, the task of 10 refereed articles this year, two book chapters, and indeed two books. Don't know if I'm going to get there, but I'm having a good go. But what this system means is I finish on one day and I start something the next day. There's no warm up. It's all going well. So this is the greatest strategy to create space in your life for writing because you have a research plan. No distraction, nothing weird, just a list of stuff that you'd like to write. It might be chapters in your thesis, it might be articles, and then move them down the table. Boom. Next one. Pick your priority. So once your whiteboard is rocking, the next vibe that you've got to organize is picking your priority. Now, there are five different strategies in the literature to pick your priority. There's good research behind them. All of them work. So it really does depend on you. So the first way to pick your priority is what is the most important project. And obviously, importance is defined in many ways, but the first priority is what is the most important. Okay, do that one. The next one is pick the publication that's closest to completion. So for your PhD, which chapter is closest to being finished, right? So work on that one, finish it. Another strategy is what's the easiest one? Another one is the oldest project. What's been the longest on the board? We'll clean that up. And finally, and this is a good one, pick the project that you most enjoy. And can I say how I do it is I always pick off the whiteboard the next piece that is the closest to being completed. That's always been my strategy. I've never used the rest. Fascinated in the research that all those priority strategies exist. They all sound great. The one I use is what's the closest to being finished. That's the one I'm going to do. But if motivation is an issue for you, and the literature shows this clearly, if motivation is an issue, pick the one that you'll enjoy the most because that will create the momentum for the next one and the system. Right. Create the opportunity for good behavior. Writing is not pleasant. Research is not pleasant. There are always fantastic things we could be doing. We could be walking in the sunshine, listening to music, watching the waves on the beach. There's always magnificent things we could be doing with our time. 
But what we've got to do with a system is create an opportunity for you to do the behaviours to create the writing and the opportunities for you to succeed. So of course that requires intervention because time will just go doing pleasant things unless you actually state, look, no, that's not how we're going to do this. So how do we do that? Well, we have the word processing program, we have the article or the chapter up the night before. So in the morning, if you do your work in the morning, there it is lid up on your computer and start. So basically you get your water, you get your cup of coffee, open the lid of your computer and do it. So your pre-night behaviours create the opportunity for success. Also block yourself, stop yourself from bad behaviour. So set your alarm and set it early and get up and also set the alarm for the conclusion of your writing task so you get a great sense of achievement and as I said the crucial thing to do is prepare the night before the task you're going to do in the morning so not one minute is wasted. Right, the desk. Your table or your desk doesn't matter, doesn't, but make sure that the surface is clean. Now I know there are students out there who obsess by the quality of their desk, the drawers, the nice chair. I get all of that. Stationery, don't get me started on stationery. I hear your pain, brothers and sisters. Now my desk, as I said, costs 20 quid. Flat pack, really, really cheap. But wow, what a great and productive space it has been. Can I say no drawers, by the way? No, there's no drawers. It's just a flat surface. So what I suggest to you, if you're having problems with your desk with stuff all over it, and I see a lot of pictures of desks that are very busy with papers and all the rest of it, I wouldn't do that. I would go full ad fab surfaces, darling, surfaces. So productivity emerges from an environment where the processes, the environment is simple and clean and straightforward. Stephen King, the legendary Stephen King, used a great line and he realized that a writer's room has one characteristic, quote, a door that you are willing to shut. End of quote. Okay, each week construct seven writing priorities, seven tasks. Now, these seven tasks, make them very small. Pick seven things that can be done in 30 minutes or in 60 minutes and do one a day. Make them achievable with a start and with an end. And by giving yourself seven clear, pretty straightforward priorities every week that you finish, then you get a great sense of achievement and micro success because if you don't name a goal, you can't achieve that goal. Therefore, when you do those seven pretty straightforward tasks, you'll never have that cry at the end of the week, oh look, I've done nothing on my thesis. Because you can say, well look, I gave myself seven tasks and I finished those. You might do a hell of a lot more than that. I get that. But if you've got the seven straightforward tasks and you've done something, that's an achievement. Okay? And all of that is based on structurally stopping all distractions. If you are distracted, then nothing else gets done. So mobile phone away, no websites up. You have to run your life rather than your mobile phone notifications running your life. Take breaks. Now I know this seems counterintuitive, but scheduling breaks into your work has shown to be incredibly useful for productivity and efficiency. Now, the most inefficient people think that they're working all the time. They're not work working all the time. We know that. They're going through Instagram. They're looking at online shopping. They're having a chat with their lab mates. They're not actually working. And that's why working in intervals, working in those short bursts, is a great way to gain success. And so after that burst, do something completely different. So yes, you can then scroll through Instagram, knock yourself out. But it is a good way to work to do 30 minutes and a 10 minute break. I do 50, so 50 minutes and a 10 minute break. Now, I don't go through Instagram in those 10 minutes. What I do is something relatively physical involving movement. And the scale of the glamour of my life is I generally involve those 10 minutes doing 
laundry or cleaning my bathroom. Oh, the glamour of contemporary life. But can I say that's also quite efficient and indeed productive because I've moved into movement. So I'm sitting, I'm writing, focused, and then I go and do something quite physical that involves me getting up and moving. So sit down with intensity, get up, do something different for 10 minutes, return. Okay, now the crunchy one. Think about the people with whom you spend time. This is such an important point for PhD students because it frames all that you do. So think about who you talk with every single day. Are they energized and excited? Are they negative? Are they panicked? Are they fearful? Are they really unhappy? So the problem with this group of people is we all become sucked into that negativity, into that fear. And other people's stuff can be quite paralyzing for us. And sort of I know this because most of my job is pretty negative, to be honest. I'm sitting in my work office and most of the time, most of my days are spent hearing complaints. That's just simply the game. And I try and solve the complaints so that the supervisor or the student can get on with their life. That's the job, right? So most of my day is just a bit... Right, So that's why I make sure that in the morning, uh, that's when I do my writing. So I do something buoyant and interesting and positive at the start of my day, which moves me into that positivity for the rest of my day. Because do remember, writing is an act of confidence. If you're spending time before or during or after your writing with pretty toxic, unhappy people, that is going to have a consequence on your writing. So get your life organized and then writing will be more productive. Consider your relationship with sound. Now, some of you write with music playing. And can I say the research shows that's quite useful. That's quite a productive strategy. You listen to music, it relaxes you, you write well. That's cool. What the research also shows, though, is that the best writing comes from silence. Don't judge yourself, though. Whatever works for you is great, okay? In fact, early in my career, I always had music playing. And the weird thing is, when I was preparing this vlog, I thought, when did I stop listening to music while I was writing? And I really can't remember. So I listened to it all the time. It created my soundscape. And then I stopped, and it was called cool too. So both do work. And, of course, silence is how I work now. But the point of the, this maxim, and it's a great one, is that we spend all our attention on the physical environment. What I'm suggesting to you today is you also need to construct your sonic environment. And you do need to construct the soundscape in which you work. And remember, you do have to construct silence. We live in very noisy post-industrial times, a lot of sonic bleeding. So if you want silence, you can't just hope you're going to get silence. You have to construct it. Say no a lot. The only way that you're going to write and be productive is saying no a lot. Every time you say no to something, you are saying yes to writing. Obviously, we all need to earn a living. Uh, we have families. Families are not raised by wolves. I understand that. But every single day, we make choices. And we say yes to completely random stuff that is completely pointless and irrelevant, don't we? Most days, we go, oh yeah. Completely bonkers stuff, right? So say no a lot. And when you say no a lot, you allow the rest of your life to be productive. And in fact, my rule, particularly as I get older, my rule is, unless the answer is hell yes, it's a no. So if I read something and go, oh, hell yes, then I'll, I'll do it. If it's just like, uh, then I'll say no. Okay, another sticky one. Address your dependencies. Are you dependent on something or someone that creates powerlessness. Now, booze is the obvious one. But if you're reliant on someone who endlessly reminds you that you're less, 
you're not important, you're marginal, you just can't do this, you're not worthy, then you're going to have to address that dependency because that dependency is acidic on any writing, on any research that you will ever do. The easiest way to manage our dependency is to replace it with something positive. So replace the booze with exercise, right? But I'm well aware there are certain dependencies that will necessitate the intervention of a health professional. And I would certainly recommend that you do that. That dependency is not going away. Because all the hopes, all the dreams, all the aspirations in the world, all the decisions wither. If you've got a hang hangover, if you're frightened, if you're bullied. So you need to be the clear thinking star of your own life. And if anything stops you being the clear thinking star of your own life, then address it. Next one, make sure that you improve something every day. My mother, who is 89, hello Doris Brabazon, my mother who is 89, once said to me about 10 years ago, life just goes on and on and on and on. A bit depressing. But she also said, perhaps more buoyantly, things could be worse. You could be dead. <laughs> you wonder how goths are created. Look at the mother. So those sorts of mantras in life focused her mind and indeed focused mine. Because the PhD has a relentlessness to it, doesn't it? It just goes on <laughs> and on and on and on. And it means we just lose the sense of the achievement. It just goes on and on, like, when is this thing going to finish? So outside of the PhD, always make sure there's something, even a small something, that improves every day. So you decide, oh, I'm not going to take the lift or the elevator, I'm going to take the stairs. It can be a different type of learning. So for example, while you're commuting, while you're on a bit of exercise equipment, listen to an audio book or a podcast in an area outside of your research. So basically, try every day to create even five minutes of a space for something new, particularly new ideas and new behaviors. And it's amazing what happens to your life when you allow that newness to emerge every single day. And this, of course, again, another advantage, creates these micro achievements, keeps you fresh, keeps you writing fresh, keeps your research fresh. And so each day becomes a bit different, not like the last. OK, so ironic it's coming from me, but still we'll go with it. Stop the gothic self-talk. <laughs> now, I'm an old goth. I know that this is not going to end well. But self-talk, that internal dialogue that I hear from PhD students every single day when they externalise it in my office, is just brutalising. Brutalising. So let's be clear. You are good enough. You're brilliant. You've got this. It's sorted. You will finish. You are, obviously, fabulous. So every time you feel yourself, every single time you feel yourself going into that negative mantra. So I'm stupid, my life is pointless, I'm never going to finish this PhD, we can just keep going on and on and on, we all have our own soundtrack. Every time you feel that coming, even in your head, stop yourself, stop it. Middle of the sentence, stop yourself and intervene, do something different. What I want you to do is stop that negative self-talk and replace it with, I am brilliant, I am amazing, I am fabulous. Can I just say, it's one of the great gifts I've had as Dean. We've talked a lot about the word fabulous in these vlogs. It's such a great word. One of my favorite stories is a six foot two, probably 13, 14 stone engineer who had a bit of a negative self-talk problem. And I said, what made the difference to you, mate? What, what allowed you to finish? And he said, oh, the vlog you did on being fabulous. So every day I wake up and I go, I'm fabulous. And, and I am, so that's what helped me. So it makes you smile. The word fabulousness, fabulous, makes you smile. So say that in yourself and it will make a difference. And I'll tell you why, I think it was Buddha. Who knew we'd go there? I think it was Buddha 
who is reported as saying, we think what we are. We think what we are. So we are what we think. Consider what all that self-talk is doing to you. Words hurt, words wound, words attack us. So start to intervene and change the story that you're telling yourself. Next one. If you can't measure it, it doesn't exist. Can I say, of course, obviously, I argue the opposite quite frequently as well. The stuff that's really important in life, like friendship and love and integrity and decency and respect, you can't measure. But let's just park that thought for a moment. But when we're dealing with work, productivity and research, if you can't measure it, it doesn't exist. So prove, bring it. Prove your productivity. Log the time you spend doing these different tasks. What time did you start? What time did you stop? What did you accomplish during that time? So firstly, these micro successes make you feel terrific. That's brilliant. But secondly, it means you can also then track your successful times. And this matters a lot, changed my life. So I structure my entire day for what's efficient, what behavior and outcome is efficient during the day. So I obviously write first thing in the morning, do my consultancy work in my office, and I read drafts in the afternoon and night. So I'm very focused on high quality reading and drafting later on in the day. So I've gone, and I've done that by being able to assess, right, where am I successful at what task? I've logged it, I've measured it, and I've gone, right, that is an efficient system, let's do that. So when you write with greater efficiency and clarity, and when you produce work of higher quality, know that. And if you know procrastination is a problem for you, really locate the best behaviours on the best time and let yourself go. So there's, there's hours of the day where you go, I'm just useless. Use those times to do the laundry. Next one. Pick your rabbit. You can't reach a goal if you haven't named the goal. You can't be successful if you don't actually know what success looks like. So name that goal. Write down that goal. Name what your vision of success may be. Then when you've got that with clarity, you've got a chance of reaching it. And look, I know that this is quite challenging and it's quite big. I find this quite difficult. At this point of my life, I'm sort of thinking, ah, oh, I wonder what success does mean. And so at the moment, I'm reflecting on this too. So at all points of your life, you think, what, what's success look like for me? What's my goal now? And one way to really focus the mind is to always ask yourself, what would you like people to say at your eulogy. Again, oh gee, it's a buoyant day, isn't it? And the great thing about that is, what would you like people to say at the end? And then you ask yourself, is the behavior that I'm enacting today allowing those people to say it at the end? And if there's no connection between what you're doing today and that end point, have a think about that. Have a think about that, make the changes. Now, my old father, Kevin, hello, Kevin Brabazon, who is 92, used to say, still does really, if you chase two rabbits, you won't catch either of them. So pick your rabbit. Change your attitude to failure. It is a myth that writers are supposedly special people, or if you write just special, nah, Writing, flesh, blood, bone, hard yakka. But what I think does create success in writing, this is me reflecting basically back on my life, so this is a bit heavy, but if successful writers do have a characteristic, I think perhaps it might be their attitude to failure. So if failure is treated like a learning opportunity, a chance to get better, then failure becomes the foundation for improvement. So if you're frightened of criticism, you will be too frightened to write. So write, just write. I know that every single word that you write 
is moving you into the correct direction. I think it was Ray Bradbury who I love. Ray Bradbury said, quote, you only fail if you stop writing. End of quote. You only fail if you stop. Next one. Have the courage to be different. If writing was easy, if a PhD was easy, everybody would do it. But the point is basically nobody can do it. It's a very, very tiny slither of every single population. So you have to recognise on a daily basis, I am doing something spectacular. I am not ordinary. Every day you need to remember that you are doing something that 99.9% .9 of the population cannot do. Wow. So you have made a decision to be different. Different from your partner, different from your friends, different from your parents, different from your kids. You've made a decision to not fit in, to stretch. So claim that. Schedule writing. Okay, this is it. This is the B. Schedule writing. The characteristic of our workplaces generally, and let's be honest, the characteristic of universities, <laughs> is on a daily basis we confuse the urgent and the important. <laughs> so you therefore need to schedule writing. Make an appointment with your writing and put it in that damn Microsoft Outlook calendar and never break that appointment with yourself. You wouldn't let your kids down, you wouldn't let your partner down, you wouldn't let your friends down. Why do you let yourself down? Make an appointment with your writing and keep it. Control what you can control. Okay, back to the gothic moment now. Look, let's be honest, life is terrible most of the time. Uh, it's changeable, it's filled with pain, angst, confusion, fear. So how do we create any sense of order from this disorder? And the answer is habits. Really simple, habits. So what we've talked about in the vlog this week is how we create order out of disorder by creating habits. So schedule a time, pick a task and complete that task. And you know what then? Sit and enjoy the success that comes from completing that task. If you are waiting for the perfect time to appear to do a PhD, you are going to be waiting forever. So do it now. Do it now. Control what you can control. Woody Allen said, someone who I don't quote very often, for obvious reasons, Woody Allen said, 70% of success in life is showing up. End of quote. And I would argue the other 30%, the bulk of that, you have control over the decisions that you make. Always remember how much you do control. And with some very simple techniques about your office, about your desk, about your time, you can finish this PhD. I wish you love, light and peace. Tea out.